Good afternoon, uh, everyone, and, and thank you all of you very much for, for being here today and for, and for your interest in this inspiring renewal session with the National Library of, of Israel as part of the program of activities of the European Days of Jewish Culture uh, 2022 with the team renewal. Uh, for the for ones that uh, you may not know me, my name is Federico Scharfer and I work in the Barcelona office uh, of the European Association for the Preservation and, and Promotion of Jewish Culture and, and Heritage, uh, the, the APJ, as a project manager uh, for the European Days of Jewish Culture and other projects of the association. The European Days of uh, Jewish Culture are a pan-European event uh, which has been organized since the, since the year 2000 with the objective to highlight the diversity and richness of Judaism and its uh, local, regional and national historical importance with the firm intention of promoting dialogue, recognition and exchange through uh, conferences, concerts, performances, guided tours and all other kinds of uh, activities, which always take place, uh, take place simultaneously uh, throughout the continent. Uh, this project has been uh, extensively reinforced by the collaboration with the National Library of Israel, which has acted as a means to develop all kinds of uh, exhibitions, uh, educational materials, and, and, so now, and so on, which have given an important added value to the festival while facilitating its celebration throughout the, the continent. In this session, following the successful dynamic initiative last year, 2021, with the inspiring dialogue sessions, we will learn about the process of renewal that the, Na that the National Library of Israel is going through and its brand new building as a symbol and a metaphor maybe of renewal in the world of Jewish culture. Today's session will be led by our friend Karon Seth Hill, with uh, whom we have had the, the enormous pleasure to, uh, to work for several, several years and whom I would like to thank once again from, from really the bottom of my heart for all, for all that she does for the European Days of Jewish Culture, for her commitment and her always uh, generous and wise contributions to the, to the festival. Uh, Karen Setfield, let me introduce her uh, briefly, is a program manager in Europe at the National Library of Israel, managing Gesher Europa, a bridge to Europe, established as part of the library's renewal process, which aims uh, to share their collections in creative ways and uh, engage people with shared in their interests working in Jewish settings in Europe. Uh, we hope that this session will inspire uh, all of us to continue working on this process of renewal and to reflect on the role of uh, Jewish culture in creating a, a more plural and inclusive Europe. And at the end of the session, of course, if all goes well, uh, we will have a, a few minutes available for a round of questions or a little discussion on the, on the subject. And uh, now, without further ado, Karen, if you are ready, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very thank much. Thank you so much, Fede. I just want to check that everybody can hear me and can see my screen. Yes? We can hear you perfectly. Thank you. Good. OK. I just want to give a, a bit of a health warning that sometimes the connection with Zoom suddenly freezes. I'm actually getting a new computer this week because this has been an ongoing problem. So I apologize in advance. But if you seem, if you stop hearing me um, and I freeze, um, then I will come back. It's, it's just as a temporary thing. Right. Um, well, thank you for your kind words, Fedi. It's really been a privilege for the National Library of Israel to be part of the European Day of, um, of Jewish Culture Community, which is now in its sixth year. Um, and to exchange ideas and resources with colleagues. And I see here, there are some familiar faces and, and hello to all our friends. I can see some familiar names from Lithuania, for example, and from France. Um, but I'm also thrilled that we've got some new people here. I hope that I'm not repeating um, things that you may already have heard, but I am bringing you some new hot off the press images from our new building. So hopefully that will be um, a, a renewed vision of the National Library sticking to our theme. Um, as I said, we really value our partnership. We've worked together to create um, 
many different uh, exhibitions now, and I'm just hoping that my, here we are, my screen is, uh, is moving. Um, here are just some examples of recent exhibitions that we've made, and I'm hoping that some of these will be familiar to you, and we're delighted that there are so many different settings. We can see in the middle the dialogue exhibition at the bottom from Lisbon, at the top I think it's from Sarajevo, and we very much value the creative ways that you have used our, um, our exhibitions and our materials. Uh, this year, we didn't make an exhibition because we had actually been expecting to right now be moving into an, our new building. And in the spirit of our move, we suggested the theme renewal, which we hope is more than just about, it's not all about us, but we feel that renewal is woven into virtually all aspects of Jewish life and practice. In fact, Jewish life is continually building on the past in new ways. So it brings a sense of constant change with reassuring continuity. And here you can see an example of that in the most published Hebrew book, which is not the Jewish Bible, but is actually the Haggadah, the Passover Haggadah that's used at the Seder um, every year. And here you can see from 1609, the very famous Venice Haggadah. Um, and, and Amsterdam Haggadah from about 100 years later. And then bringing right up to date, you can see a Haggadah that was created online for people to use at their Seder during COVID. So you can see this thread over the centuries and, and um, that, that is still familiar no matter what age you are running your, holding your, your Pesach Passover Seder. And of course, um, the Jewish New Year, which we've just celebrated with the festivals of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, present an opportunity to reflect and acknowledge our past actions, looking ahead with new optimism and determination um, as we strive to actively renew our aspirations for the coming year and beyond. So this concept of starting again or pressing recent is integral to the Jewish annual cycle and you can see here the lunar calendar that um, a diagram that we have of the lunar calendar that we used in a series of films we made about the holidays the the new year holidays and just yesterday we finished reading in in fact in synagogues across um, across Europe and the world in outside Israel, it's today that they finished reading the last portion of the Torah scroll, Vazot Habracha. And what do we do after we finish? We immediately start again and we start reading the first chapter of Genesis of Bereshit. Um, we, I wasn't going to show you some Torah scrolls as such, but here we have some of the flags that are traditionally used. And again, you can see how things have changed. There is a flag here with an image of Theodor Herzl along with Moses and Aaron from um, before, well, you know, from the beginning of the, the Zionist movement and the discussions of, of um, setting up a homeland in, in what was then Palestine. And then you can see some examples of flags which are very modern. Um, one of the telltale signs that these are very modern is because you can see women um, holding the, the Torah, um, which is not necessarily part of the traditional approach. Um, in my synagogue yesterday, there were many women holding and I actually was able to read from the Torah. So that's sort of a sign of the times. And I'll talk a little bit more about how these changes are reflected in our collection. Well, in the coming year, the National Library will be celebrating the culmination of a very long process of renewal when our beautiful new building opens to the public in Israel and opens to the rest of the world. Um, we're planning that the opening will take place in March next year in 2023. Um, and the, the stunning new library campus in Jerusalem will contain and showcase our diverse reflections of Jewish life and culture, as I just started to describe, and showing how they have changed and renewed across generation. So I'd like to give you a preview of this new building and present it as a metaphor for our theme of renewal this year. Whilst our current program of renewal has been, un has been undergone since 
2007. That's the, the official time when the National Library of Law was, was published, um, which we hope will and benefit not just the citizens of Israel, but the Jewish people and the Jewish, uh, the Jewish world, um, you know, across all the different countries and across all the different ways Jewish culture is interpreted. Um, and that will be very much focusing on the 21st century. However, our renewal started well before 2007, and we recently actually celebrated 130 years. You can see here, this reading room in Jerusalem was established 130 years ago in 1892. And it is due to the renewed thinking of the cultural leaders at the time. Um, I want to pay tribute to uh, Yosef Khazanovich, who was a doctor in Bialystok, and he was one of several people who are writing about um, the need to bring together the outputs of Jewish learning and scholarship, looking at it very academically and in more elitist way maybe than we interpret libraries today. And they set up this um, together with B'nai Brit, who I know are involved in the European Day of Jewish Culture. They set up the Midrash Barbanel Library in Jerusalem which is now in B'nai Brit Street um, in the center of the city. And then it moved to the university, to the Jewish, what was then we called ourselves the Jewish National University Library, once the um, Hebrew University was set up in 1925. And then, as I mentioned, in 2007, there was a new law of the National Library of Israel. And I just want to sort of, ref sort of spend one, you know, one slide reflecting on another hero who is in the center of the bottom row of this photograph of staff at the National Library of Israel in 1935, and that is Professor Hugo Bergman, who was um, immigrated to Israel from Germany, and he took the library to new levels, befitting its new home at the Hebrew University in Mount Scopus. So this was taken 10 years after we moved to the Hebrew University. And what's very striking, first of all, is that there are only about 30 people here. We now have a staff of well over 300. And in fact, um, the list, um, I have seen the list of the people um, featured in this in this um, the photograph, and it even includes the cleaning staff. So this is the total number of staff in uh, in the Jewish National University Library. Then, in 1960, after we uh, after the um, War of Independence, we had to leave um, Mount Scopus, as did the university. Our collections was were scattered around the city, city of Jerusalem, as was the university. And only in 1960 did we move into the, our current home, which is in the Give Up Ram campus of the Hebrew University, as opposed to the Mount Scopus one. And what happened then was that the, um, with after the Six Day War and the uni reunification of Jerusalem, humanities and arts and Jewish studies moved to um, back to Mount Scopus, but we stayed in Givat Ram, which is actually a science campus and where there is a lot of renewal, a lot of innovation going on. Um, some of it you, you may re read about, but we are this island of Jewish studies and Jewish scholarship, which until 2007 wasn't even open to children under the age of 16 to come in unaccompanied. So here's just an outside version of our outside image of our Karen building. And here is the reading room, which uh, some of you may have, have visited and, and will recall. Um, but by 2002, we were thinking, where next? What befits a national library in a developing state where there's not just the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, but there are now seven universities. So we are now in the sort of the, the focus of our current stage of the renewal is to really you know, express our global aspirations and to share our treasures with the world. And it's very much embodied in our uh, mission statement, which really has, stood the test of time. It was written and, and it was um, drafted from 2002. There were various committees looking at the, the mission of the library. Um, and we still think that it pretty much represents what we want to, what we want to be and what we aspire to deliver. So you would expect a national library to collect, 
and preserve. That's what many libraries do, not just national libraries. But cultivating means taking our collections and using them to create new resources uh, and to really think about how we can um, give them new life. And endow, mean, endow means sharing them, sharing these treasures that we have with people like yourselves and your audiences and your communities around the world. So these treasures include significant handwritten works by luminaries such as Maimonides, Sir Isaac Newton. We have exquisite Islamic manuscripts dating back to the ninth century, personal archives of leading cultural and intellectual figures, Martin Buber, Natan Sharansky, and Naomi Shemer. And these have been collected over 130 years. And they've always been available to visitors who come to the library in Jerusalem. And now we're thinking about how we make these accessible online. So our collections have always and remain um, the center of everything we do. And they're arranged in four thematic areas. You can see um, a beautiful image from the Rambam's Mishnah Torah on the right-hand side, Maimonides, an illustrated man, Ill illuminated manuscripts. We have a beautiful Islamic manuscript um, as well here, which you can see um, near, near the, the center of this slide. Um, we have Sir Isaac, we have a humanities collection, um, which is um, which is a collection of many different treasures that help inform and underpin the other collections. Uh, here you see um, an image of Nicholas Flamel, who is not um, only a character in uh, Harry Potter books, but actually is uh, featured in Isaac Newton's papers from the 17th century. And on the far left, we have um, an, an excerpt from the Israel collection, the Israeliana collection. This is part of the very special uh, Hannah Senesh archive that we received last year from her family and which has um, been digitized and has an enor enormously significant um, addition, very moving, uh, showing her life and her writings before her, her final journey. To, to, to Hungary, to Croatia, where she was captured and then sentenced to death. So this is just sort of give you a very sort of brief um, view. And of course, our, our um, collections are not just books. And here, in fact, we've shown manuscripts and archives. Um, we have personal archives um, of many leading figures. We have, on you can see here, Franz Kafka, Martin Buber, and as I mentioned before, Natan Sharansky has, has given us his, his archive. And we also have the archive of the famous uh, songwriter and singer, Naomi Shemer. So we, we have many, many resources that we can join on, uh, that we can draw on, and we use them creatively. Um, and we very much value, as I mentioned, the opportunity to, to present these to your audiences through the European Day of Jewish Culture. So here is just a, a, an example of how um, on our website you can find many, many digital resources. We cannot digitize everything. It's not that the scanning is just one part of the process of digitization, as I'm sure many of you realize. It's creating um, platforms to make these accessible to everybody, to deal with copyright issues, um, to make sure that they can be searchable. There's many, many functions that surround this whole digitization process. Um, I'll show you some more examples of that soon. But one of the most important audiences we have um, are ed educators, children who um, really it's about renewing our collections for new audiences, making them constantly relevant and trying to help them connect through our materials to their heritage. We've recently launched um, a new education website in English. And what I can do, Fede, is send a list of the links that are of the tools that I'm referring to in this talk. Um, the new, you can see here the, the example, just the front page of our, um, of our website. And we also have a lovely a program called Writing My Chapter, which is targeting young people who are about to celebrate their bar or their bat mitzvah with 13 different stations 
and sections. And in the end, what we want them to do is upload um, materials from their celebrations and from the way they have marked this milestone in their Jewish life. It's very important for me to say that we are continuing to collect. So what is happening now in Europe and in the way people are, are living their Jewish lives is as relevant as the Hannah Senesh photograph or the manuscript that you will see here from, from centuries ago. It's all part of the continuum of the Jewish story and tremendously important. So here is just uh, some examples of the um, digitization programs that we have um, and some figures that just give you some uh, an idea of the extent um, of what we have um, digitized. We are very, um, we are very particular about enabling um, other collections to be made accessible in partnership with um, heritage institutions. We know that particularly in Europe, there are many, many institutions with Judaic materials. And what we want to do is to help them um, bring these to the forefront of knowledge dissemination so that researchers and historians um, and the wider public can connect with Jewish collections held across the world. We work very hard to develop these partnerships that are to enable them to be mutually beneficial so that all of the richness of, of Jewish culture can be made available. And I know I'm speaking to a converted audience given that you're involved in AEPJ and the European Day. Um, so here's just an example of our platform for the um, international Hebrew manuscripts. We are aiming to be able to make available collections from across the world, every Hebrew manuscript across the world. We just had a call today with colleagues at the Historical Archive in Girona, um, where we have some, um, some Hebrew manuscripts uh, from their collections, which were hidden as bindings inside other books. So it's, it's almost an endless search, but at some point we're going to have to say we've completed this mission. And as you can see, um, we have about 85% of Hebrew manuscripts that we're aware of digitized on this platform. And also the historical press program, the J Press program, which we um, which we have historical uh, Jewish press, and we have just. I know we've got people, I believe, from Lithuania on this call um, with the National Library of Lithuania, with the National Library of Latvia, and most recently with the National Library of Serbia to help bring their Jewish titles to the fore in the local languages. And we also have a parallel um, program for Arabic newspapers called Jayared, which amazingly has millions of entries from countries in the Arab world and scholars of Arab uh, culture in this in the Middle East from around the world um, and from countries with which Israel does not have diplomatic relations. So that's a very encouraging and, and very important thing to, to mention here. I also want to mention that we are also looking at helping others um, have a renewed understanding of their collection. We have a professional training program, which is, I would say, the flagship program of the work we do in Europe, which is under the banner of uh, Gesher l'Europa, Bridge to Europe. But here, this is called At the Source. And that's another way of ensuring that um, resources overseas, it's not just about digitizing, but that engaging with the people who are looking after them. And I know, I think Ruta, you will be able to validate this. I think you might even be in one of these pictures. So you can put in the chat if you, if you do recognize that. Okay, now to the building. Um, the new and renewed National Library will stand as a landmark it's sy symbolically located in Jerusalem by the Knesset, the uh, Supreme Court and government ministries. And you can see a sort of a sketch here, which shows, um, shows where we are located. And here are, here's the actual grounds. Here's the, we are now able to show images. It was the 
seventh year in the Schmitta cycle, where um, planting and, and agriculture is, is stopped in, in Israel. And so here you can see these beautiful gardens and the beginning of the building. And in order to fulfill its mission, um, the National Library encompasses three elements, and I'll, I'll talk about those. Um, because we need to facilitate the maximum number of users, all of whom might be coming to the library for different purposes. There'll be the, the core audience who are readers and scholars who will want to sit and study our collections in quiet um, and to also meet with other scholars. We will have visitors who will be coming to our exhibition space. Um, we will be having um, guests coming for an event in the evening. We'll have people who will just want to walk, walk around and sit and have a cup of coffee. Um, and we will be, of course, having sort of programs for educators as well. So we're, we're really trying to make sure that the building will address all of these, um, all of these functions. And you can see here, this cross section is also important to note, if you look and you can see Rupin Boulevard, that's actually the street level. Um, but a lot of the library will be underground. And one of the stipulations was, was that the library should be shaped sort of in a long and shallow way um, design rather than an, a towering building. With that soon. Here is um, an image of the reading rooms and I'll show you some actual images so you get some idea of how that's how that's taking shape. Um, you know we we you know have included there sort of different components that suit the different ways that people might want to learn and study. Here is um, here is a an image of the study carols and you can see different types of seating. Um, and there are also smaller rooms where people will be able to sit even more quietly. I should have mentioned earlier that the um, building is designed by the renowned Swiss architects Herzog and de Meuron. Much of the internal fitments are from other countries, in particular Italy. Uh, the shelves are from, um, com from companies in, and furniture from different com companies in Italy. I don't know if we have anyone from Italy on, the, on this uh, on this event. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we have a beautiful education center where it will be an extremely experiential um, center for, for young people coming in, an auditorium um, where we will be holding beautiful cultural events, where it, there will also be external venues, which I will show you later in this preservation in this presentation. And we also want to make sure that there's a secure and sustainable environmental um, conditions to ensure the long-term preservation of our collections, the, which is the, we are responsible for these cultural treasures of the Jewish people, not just from Israel, but from around the world. And we take that very seriously. Um, and it's important to note here that the new home of the National Library will be one of the most sustainable buildings in the Middle East. You can see here, I'm not an expert on the various um, standards and, and certificates that are needed, but it's the lead, the highest level of LEED, L-E-E-D certification, um, ensures that we have minimal environmental, environmental impact for the immediate and the distant future. You can see at the bottom, right um uh, what looks like a collection of rocks which may look a bit strange that was one of the first things that was created very much below ground which is um, a natural way of um cooling um, and temperature control in the building so air will be pushed through these rocks it's called the thermal pre-cooling system so we're very state-of-the-art in in that um it's also important to note that the new building responds to our ambitions and, and our sort of more conceptual vision of the National Library. It's open and transparent. There are no fences, as you now see, if you want to come into the, the current location within the campus of the Hebrew University. But it's also grounded in the traditional traditions of great libraries and the eternal city of of Jerusalem itself. So there's the absence of walls. We want to 
respect our materials, but also make them very accessible. You can see books from everywhere. Now, if you come into the library, you have to walk upstairs and open the door of a reading room and then go in. I can spend um, days coming to work and if I don't go upstairs, I don't actually see books. Anyone coming into the library now, the first thing you will see is books and actually there'll be vitrines and vistas through to the books, even from the places which are our staff only. And as, as I mentioned that we, we don't want to just offer places to read. We want, as you saw in these slides about the education center and the cultural events, it's just a place to be. And we want the grounds to invite people into, into the building. So in terms of the sort of concept to the reality, I just want to show, this is the initial sketch that was in one of the very first meetings um, with the architects that has transitioned to this concept. Um, as in the past, in the traditional libraries, the books and other physical works remain at the center and they are really the foundation and necessary balance against constant technological change much like the Jewish tradition, because whilst um, change, we, as we were discussing, or as I discussed before, changing and adapting with the times is, is sort of a feature of Jewish life, our core beliefs remain rooted in the canon of our written works, which are then reinterpreted with the, with the times. So the building design reflects this, the spiral designs um, roots the building to the ground and our books are visible in a central void as I mentioned and very transparent and there's a skylight that will illuminate the sea of books um, which is what we call this this structure with natural light which filtered to protect them. Um, this is the central reading hall it's in three levels it goes from the general to the specific. So when you come in, the ceilings are higher and then they gradually get lower, not oppressively low, but lower as when you go down to the rare books, there's more of a feeling of intimacy and, and sort of privacy when you're actually engaging with, with our rare treasures. So here you can see some of that, um, oops. You can see some of that uh, actually taking place. This is uh, one of the staircases leading down through the sea of books. I just want to um, mention another aspect of innovation, um, which is our automatic underground stacks, which are also um, developed um, partly by um, technology from Italy. Uh, we are not going to be perpetuating the stores with many people running around and small little um, pulleys and, and little um, boxes on, on rollers going around with, with people needing to sort of actually find books. You'll be able to find a book online, order it, and then that will be, message will be sent down to the whole um, system down here, which is actually managed by robots. And you'll be able to see these boxes. You can already see it because we already have, um, um, I'll show you an image of that again later, but we already have nearly 3 million books in the new stacks, even though we're still operating in our own old building, which is another set of challenges temporarily for us to be continuing to serve our audiences here, even though the books are not all no longer in, in this current building. So I just thought that would be something that I'm sure um, even those that have heard me speak about the library won't have seen this particular image. And alongside all this sort of new thinking, the architects have very much incorporated a renewed version of Jerusalem's historical architecture. So here is the solid mass carved out of stone. This is a real picture in the beautiful sunset. Um, and there's lots of cars parked. Car parking is a is a is a, um, a subject that is I'm sure going to be of great interest to our to our um, public and and for the staff. But I just wanted to show this as a beautiful image of this huge sort of rock that's going to be the the sort of main feature. And the architects actually were very careful to connect with the architecture in Jerusalem. Here is the most iconic image of Jerusalem, but have a look here at how they've taken the sort of a contemporary take on the limestone of the Kotel of the Western Wall. Here you can see that. 
and formed these curved, elevated and cantilevered cutouts on the outside of our building. So that there is very much a sort of cultural specific imagery, which also sort of reflects text and the sort of early, early sort of um, writings that you that were found Protestant writings. You can still you can see here this was actually an image from the facade, which is reflected inside, and and those shapes will be sort of echoed through different parts of the building. And for those of you that um, come to our events when we have them overseas, we've been giving out this bookmark, which is um, a, a take on the take of the reflecting back to the to the Western Wall. So I'm, I hope that we'll be able to pass those souvenirs on um, and get people excited about coming to the building in, in advance of them, of you being able to actually visit. And here again is the is the image of the reading room. And one of the main features which we haven't had till now is a place to actually show our treasures, which is really much needed. Um, our exhibitions display the centrality of the written text uh, in Jewish belief in, and Jewish thought and the superiority of the word over other means of expression, as well as the creative textual achievements of Islam and Christianity. So we really want to highlight cross-cultural encounters through our collections and inspire multicultural discussions, explore themes including the letter as the essential component of the written word of the alphabetic script, which was invented in the Mediterranean basin, and the evolution of the book from a scroll to the printed digital formats, and now we're scrolling again, the Bible and its influence on the world and Jewish culture and to reflect Israeli creativity. So this is a whole multicultural mosaic that really characterizes the rich cultural life in Israel and beyond. And we also recognize and will be featuring the way that Christianity and Islam have also offered a renewed perspective on the Jewish Bible and its tenets, but that in parallel, Jewish um, tradition never stops interpreting, its, interpreting itself. So this reading is always renewed and visited, revisited, as, we were, as I mentioned before, in the annual cycle of study and commentary. So I want to just show you two very interesting expressions of um, our um, collections, which are not books. On the left, you can see um, an image of what is uh, an amulet, an incantation bowl, which um, we received an amazing collection of these. And you can see on the left-hand side, this black case with these circles in them. These are sort of these incantation bowls, which have magic, of supposedly magic properties to ward off the evil eye. They were used either for people to read and walk in, in this spiral to ward off the evil eye. We also have traditional amulets, which are little scrolls, or to bury them under your, under your house. And this other work is an amazing piece, one of three, that we are hugely privileged to have by the famous contemporary ceramicist Edmund Duval, who created this as part of the Library of Exile um, at the Venice Biennale uh, two years ago. And this is Psalm number four. This is one of his ceramic interpretations of Jewish texts. So that also will be, will be visible and I hope very much an attraction in, in the new building. So I also want to sort of reflect again on renewal in terms of, um, of text. Here you can see um, the way that, um, that text, learning text has changed. Here is the Bomberg Talmud, which is the uh, most famous way of setting out the oral law of, of, um, of Judaism, the, the books of the Talmud, which is based on the six book, Mishnaic books. And the way it is now, the same page of Menachot, um, page two, is available now online with Safaria, the online, amazing online tool, which is basically offers the world Jewish texts in a very accessible and, and clear way and with whom we cooperate. So this also talks about the renewal, as I was saying before, of the original texts, but the way they're presented in a different way. Um, I just want to check that everybody can still hear me. Yeah, Frederico, are we okay? We are perfect. Good, okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Um, and we're also looking at the renewal of Ivrit, of the Hebrew language, in terms of the recovery of the past. You know, where there was a Jewish presence, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's, um, you know, there's a renaissance long before the creation of the state of Israel. I know in many of your countries, we were particularly taken when we were in Lithuania and Latvia for the At The Source course at the amazing records of Hebrew being used in schools uh, and for education well before the establishment of the state, which before the creation of the state of Israel had received, had achieved the status of a spoken language at the end of the 19th century is now obviously the official language of the state of Israel. And this has been the renewal and the revival of an ancient tongue. So you can see here, um, the um, there's an old poster of teaching how to, you know, how to um, describe women's clothing, which is very dated to the end of the 19th century. And then, um, a, a poster about the, the Hebrew banana, trying to encourage people to buy Hebrew products um, in the early years of the state. And both of these are used in our educational programs. And th there's many, there's, there's endless ways that the Jewish language has been revived as presented in our collection, um, you know, pioneered by Eliezer ben Yehuda. And also there, there are other Jewish languages are now sort of being revived. We had our first exhibition with the European Day of Jewish Culture in 2016 was of Jewish languages. And we have many items in our collections in Ladino and in Yiddish um, and in Judeo-Arabic and Judeo-Italian. And, and they are immensely important and used obviously by scholars. And then there's music, Neta al Kayam and other artists, um, Dudu Tasa, who have taken this language and created contemporary music um, from their ancestors' languages. So this is a whole area of renewal, which is so, so excited. Um, I just want to mention that another um, way to understand the concept of renewal is the sense of recovery of the past, where there was a Jewish presence, which despite its disappearance has left a legacy, an inheritance, without which we wouldn't be able to understand the present. And I was showing a slide before of, at the source of the way that we um, are trying to help people understand and preserve their collections wherever ever they are located in Europe and to sort of make this legacy accessible. In particular, we've got a program with the National Library of Rome and the um, Union of Jewish Communities in Italy to catalog every Hebrew book in Italy. There are many collections which are very scattered and people don't know what is where, and we're trying to bring this together. And this is the website from Italia Books, that, that project, which is very much pioneering and could be replicated um, in other, in other um, contexts and other countries. So again, just sort of looking at the renewal, we have um, the experiential center. Um, we will also be having this, this is just an image of our, of um, an, uh, an arch architect's impression of the other side of the auditorium, which I was showing before. And we really hope that you know, our vision is for diverse audiences to come to the library for concerts, for exhibitions, um, and to enjoy themselves. Um, all of it connected with our treasures and to be a meeting place for writers and scholars. Uh, here's a picture of that we, we hope will be coming to fruition very soon um, with outdoor activities um, screened onto that, um, that vitrine at the back of the stage of the auditorium. We want writers and artists to engage with our collections in new ways. And this is um, a program that we've just launched this year and we're piloting this year. It's called Sadeh. We have residencies for Israeli writers and poets, Jewish and Arab. And here is the first time that we've actually invited international artists to join Israeli counterparts. And we have decided to call this sadeh, which means field. It sort of means sort of an area for fertility and, and imagination. Um, and it's sort of like, like a, um, an incubator. And what we've actually done is taken six um, comics artists and asked them, given them an immersion experience in, in our collections and asked them to create small comic books based on a particular aspect of our collections. These will be produced as books um, in Hebrew and in English and will be available in our new building. 
But I mentioned music earlier. The next um, round we're hoping to launch in 2023 to 24 will be residencies for musicians. So we will um, keep you posted on that because we really hope that the European Day of Jewish Culture Network will help us identify people to, to, um, to join that program. Though obviously we will be limited by funding, but we do hope that we can have some, some really good um, interactions for musicians and for musical producers from, from Europe in this program next year. I'm going, I'm going to now talk about something that um, is, is in the library, but not inside the building. It's um, an artwork called Letters of Light. It's a unique artwork by Micha Olman, the renowned Israeli um, award-winning artist. And it's set upon a circular plaza of about 600 meters. And it's based on 22 Hebrew letters carved out of natural stone. Um, some of you may have heard me present this um, if you have intended, if there's anyone here from the UK, because I presented this a couple of times, but I'm hoping that this will still be of interest to you. The idea is that these are carved out of stone and they enable the sunlight to pass through and create the letters in the shadows. You can see, maybe you can see, recognize some of these letters, the bet, the iron, the lamed around here. Um, and so it's a, a play of... It very much symbolizes the interdependence between nature and man. Now, this work is in direct dialogue with Micha Orman's uh, work, The Empty Library in Babelplatz, which commemorates this dreadful um, moment, unfortunately more than one moment, commemorating the perverse destruction of Jewish books in 1933, which was an evil precursor to the terrible... Of the of the Babel now with this very striking stark reminder here you can see it with empty bookshelves um, uh, sort of ne you know which speak for themselves there's there's room for twenty thousand books and you know how appropriate that we'll be ce celebrating the renewal of Jewish scholarship and study with this sculpture which celebrates Jewish life next to the home of the books and here it is in real this isn't an artistic impression I was actually there when the first letters were put up which is tremendously moving to see how thrilled Micha Ullman was um, and underground there is a chamber where when the sun is overhead you will be able to see the images and, and I hope you can make out here the Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's sort of very much um, uh, a living rather than the cold sealed um, artistic artistic piece that you have in Babelplast. This, uh, uh, this will be a chamber that people can walk into. There'll be descriptions there um, of of this sort of concept behind um, the letters of light. Um, and what's very interesting is that the letters themselves are not arranged in the Aleph, Bet, Gimel, in the order of the alphabet. They are actually, um, they are actually arranged in according to which part of our mouth we use to say the letter. So it's very much about the beginning of speech and the beginning, very universal of, of human of human um, uh, communication. And I think it's good to, for sort of before I sort of go on to sort of the, this very final slide uh, to say that uh, I think that the European days of culture are also a renewal of culture that some thought was irrevocably destroyed and of relations with our neighbors that people thought may have been destroyed um, after the show, after the Holocaust in Europe. And, and you are real examples of the renewal and the revival of that in the work that you're doing. So we're tremendously conscious and appreciative of that and want to support that as much as we can. So just sort of, I, this was in May, but um, we have um, 
as I said, we've now got 30, through 3 million books in the new stacks. And now if you go, if you go into the building, from various places around Jerusalem, from our stacks in, in, in Givat Ram. And I just want to sort of come full circle to that initial reading room where Yosef Khazanovich had, had sent the first books to, to create the beginnings of the National Library. Those same books were the first books that we put into the new building. We want to sort of keep that, that sort of thread with, with our past, which is, which is so important. So that's really is coming, coming full circle. Um, and I just want to end with a quote by the, the late Rabbi Sachs who came to the library in, in 2014 and in 2017. And he spoke so um, resonantly about, the, about the, the way he saw and the, the image of his image of the home of the book for the people of the book. Um, to build this home of the book dedicated to people of that book as a project that can bring blessing, not just to Israel, not just to the Jewish people worldwide, but to the entire world. And that, that's our hope. Um, you know, we have the Jewish, the tradition of saying Shehechianu, the blessing, um, when we experience new things, it gives thanks for our ability to continue to live and to be renewed. So we are looking forward to saying that blessing of renewal in the new building, and we look forward to welcomingly you all there. Thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, uh, uh, Karen. It has been a, a magical and, and, and inspiring and very inspiring uh, session. Uh, also, I think that there's a great coincidence with uh, almost with Simchat Torah, with the with uh, this meaningful moment of uh, starting the year all around, of, uh, as you mentioned at the start, it's a uh, it's a great opportunity to talk about uh, renewal once uh, once again. Uh, thank you to all the participants here, uh, and also thank you to the public that may be uh, uh, seeing this uh, presentation on on YouTube.